By the grace of God, amen, I have been raised To a future without end, I set my eyes On a true and loyal friend The one whose life I'm hidden in Worship Him today, say Gospel mystery From the heavens came a Savior From the ground rose a King And every day is born in darkness and Every winter is the spring Speak of resurrection, even in the suffering. Come on, let's sing, church. You can do anything, you 
can do anything. My eyes will see your glory. My eyes will see your glory. You can do anything. You can do anything. My eyes will see your glory. My eyes will see your glory. Your home we're reaching for is you, Jesus. As the sisters beg the Savior, come at once to Bethany. If you know this is true today, sing it. But he's still the resurrection. Yes, you love Jesus. Sing. So crucify your hesitation, oh Lord, do it, wounded expectation, bring 
Will you welcome resurrection? Will you crown the risen King? Cause we know you can do it all. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. Yeshua, we call to you today. Yahweh, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Come on, just begin to name off his names today in your own way. That that God has many names and his very name can bring healing to your body. His very name can change your situation in an instant. And today, I believe there's some people in this room that need to be resurrected. Maybe it's your faith. Maybe it's your strength today. The Lord wants to resurrect your strength, your ability to move, your ability to see, your ability to preach, your ability to share the gospel. Come on, church. Just give Him glory today. Give Him praise in this room. Yes, we know. So today, we're still in this sermon series, no doubt, and I'm going to be preaching on something, to, something in this service that I've, that I've never talked about uh, in, in prior sermons or series. Uh, I'm going to title the message today, Faith in the Marketplace. Faith in the Marketplace. Back in December, the Lord gave me the title of this message today. I had no clue what the content would be, had no clue what the scripture reference would be. The Lord just said, preach on faith in the marketplace. And so today I'll be mentioning, mentioning, (laughs) that was hard to get out. I'm going to be mentioning the word marketplace several times. Okay. How's that? Now, The marketplace is defined as an open area where a market is held in a town. And earlier today, I was was asking the question, how many of you guys remember or have been to the farmer's market in downtown Maryville? Can I see your hand if you've been there? A couple of you have. So so what happened? When I was a young child, my uh, grandparents, they would bring us into, uh, into downtown Maryville and there would be farmers. There would be people who had gardens, and they would have tables set up, and on the tables would be vegetables, fruits, things like that, and they would be for sale. And so you'd go up to the table, and you'd buy your fresh fruit, and, uh, and I think a lot of the farmers were showing off uh, how, how big they could grow a watermelon or a tomato and things like that, but, but that was the marketplace that I knew of when I was a, a child. So, but today, in the context that I'm going to be using, you can substitute workplace for marketplace. And, and, and so, a couple things I wanted to bring to your attention before I dive into the word. The staff of this church makes up about 1% of the total attendees. From all of our services, our campuses, about 1% of our attendees are staff. And, and so, close to 99% of you work in the marketplace. And I think that's why the Lord just directed me to speak on it. Because he said, that's where the body of Christ, uh, the majority of them are working in the marketplace. And so how many of you realize that you are in the middle of the harvest field? You're right in the middle of the harvest field, and that's exactly where you need to be. 
That's exactly where God wants you to be, is in the harvest field. I want you to look at Luke chapter 10, verse 1. The verse goes like this. He said, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Now, we realize that Jesus had 12. Last week, we, talk, we talked about the, the inner circle of three, then the 12, then the 120, then the 500. Uh, but right here, the Bible says that he had 70 others than the 12, and he sent them uh, ahead of him. He was sending them not to the synagogues, not to the churches, but he was sending them to the cities or to the marketplace where he would be coming and where he would be showing up in the near future. Look at verse 2. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great. Say the harvest is great. The harvest truly is great, but there's an issue. And here's the issue. The laborers are few. Therefore, he said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. If you would leave that verse up there for a second. There's an important point here that I don't want us to miss. And that is the great harvest is not found in the church. The great harvest is found in the marketplace. And so, so many times when we think about the harvest, we think about people getting saved, people coming to Christ. We think, okay, all that's going to happen on a Sunday morning at Revolution Church. But I want you to realize something. The greatest ministry happens in the marketplace. And that's out there where you work. And I want you to notice as well in this verse, he's saying that we should pray for more laborers. And he also said to send them out. Now, the send them out comes from one Greek word, and in the Greek, it's much more forcible than we read. I want you to look at it for a second. It means to push them forward or to actually thrust them out. So in other words, it'd be more like this. He's saying that. He said, take the body of Christ and push them out of the church. Send them out in the harvest field. Don't allow them to become complacent and just to stay within the teachings and the confines of the four walls of the church. No, your job is to prepare them. There's a harvest out there. There's a great harvest out there, and, it's, and the harvest depends on the church being thrust out. So think about that. As a matter of fact, this same word is the exact word that's used for casting demons out of a, out of a possessed person. It's the same word used for casting out demons. Think about that for a second. I've been in foreign countries and I've seen people demon possessed. I've cast out demons, not only in foreign countries, but in this country. And many times it's not a, it's, it's a forcible event. It's not just something that happens. Many times there's, there, there's, a, there's a lot of activity around that. Well, there should be a lot of activity in terms of pastors equipping the body of Christ and sending them out in the, into this world. We need to be thinking about that because that's where the harvest truly is at. Now, so when we talk about a lack, he said there's a lack of laborers. Today, there's not a lack of professional clergymen. There's not a lack of professional pastors or bishops. There's plenty of them. I show up every week in, in, in pastor's meetings and prayer meetings, and there's several men there that, that, that don't even have churches that they're pastoring. There's not a lack in preachers. There's not a lack in, again, professional clergymen. Here's where I see the lack. It's for clergymen that understand how to effectively minister in the harvest. You see, it's, this is not effectively ministering in the harvest, me sitting down and proclaiming and sharing a sermon or a message. No, listen, effective ministry happens when the rubber meets the road and you get out there hand in hand. You're working with somebody. You're talking with somebody. You're ministering to somebody. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And it's what, you're do it's what you do. It's what you're called to do. It's what the body of Christ is called to do. You want to understand why people don't attend our churches anymore? We're not equipping them well. We're not equipping them with the tools they need to go out into the marketplace. It's true. So I want to equip you. Today, I feel like that God has given me the ability to speak into your life. I work more time in the secular world than I have been uh, serving as a pastor. I've served here for 15 years. I worked for the city of Maryville for, uh, for right at 20 years. And before that, I had a couple more jobs. So the majority of my life I spent in the secular world. I know what it's like to get up on Monday morning 
and go to work. Anybody know what it's like to get up on Monday morning and go to work? How many of you are just like looking forward to that? <laughs> I got one here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a grind. It's not easy because we're in the world. But I want you to understand something. Jesus could have created a, an area or an island and sent his 12 there to share scripture verses back and forth and to learn it all. And that would be their job until they miraculously just moved on into heaven. That's not what he called them to do. He called them to go ye therefore into the marketplace, into the workplace, into to the areas where others won't go so that they could reap a harvest. And so I want you to understand what my job is. My role is to equip you. If I'm not equipping you to go out into your workplace, to go out into the marketplace and effectively minister, then I'm failing as a minister. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? And, and so today, in the next few minutes, I'm hoping that I can give some nuggets that will help you. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He said, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For what purpose? Somebody help me right here. For equipping of the saints. So what's the saints going to do? They're going to they're gonna do the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, so the job of the pastors is to equip the saints so they can go out and do the actual ministry. Because as I said earlier, the harvest, the great harvest is not here. I was counting cars lined up to get into this place today. Before I walked in here, before the second song, when I was, I was still in my office and I was preparing to come in here and I looked out on 321 on a, cold, on a rainy day and the cars were lined up to get into this place. Somebody give him some praise right there because that's not the case everywhere. Can I tell you what, that, what message that sends to this pastor? Is that you guys are listening and you get it and you're going out into the harvest and you're working it. And I thank God for you because that's what we're called to do. And, and so as a staff, our biblical assignment is to resource each one of you for marketplace ministry and then to send you out, okay? So, so today as you're leaving the building, if you feel something pop you in the rear, you know I'm out here at the door. Not with my hand. With my, with. I heard somebody say, no, 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 no. Don't, don't freak out. Nothing like that's gonna happen. What I want to do right now, <laughs> you got to be careful what you say, you know. Here's the thing about it, too. When you're live, there's no editing. I'm going to ask, if you're a staff member at this church, if you serve on staff at this church, would you stand up right now? Any staff members in the I know a lot of them are working. I want you guys to look around. Stand up if you would. Look around right here. Stay, stay standing. I'm going, to, I'm going to say a couple things. Many people look at at Pastor Chris right here, and they say, well, his role is to just lead in worship. And that's one of his roles. But his role goes way beyond that. There's about 70 people that's part of this church that re report to our worship ministry. And his job is to equip all 70 who are not full-time to go out into the world and reap the harvest. Can I hear an amen? You guys with me now? Over here's Adam. A Adam, come on, give it up for Adam. He's our youth minister. He meets on Wednesday night here and pours into your children, pours into the youth. I want you to understand what he's doing. He's not up here just trying to make the youth feel good. He's not just trying to give them a, a great message where they'll clap and applaud. No, he's trying his best to equip them because he realizes that Thursday, they're gonna get up and they're gonna go in to the enemy's backyard. And that's the public school system. And he's preparing them for that, equipping. We understand our role. We understand what God's called us to do. Can I hear an amen? amen? If you serve as a deacon in this church, would you stand up? You and your wife, the deacons and deaconesses, stand up. Come on, give it up for those guys.
If you serve as a pastor, if you're a pastor of this church, I want you to stand up. You serve a pa- as a pastor at any level, stand up. Okay. Now, I want you to look right here, guys. This is people who are committed to resourcing you, committed to being there for you. These are people that are, their job is to equip and to serve you. So, so I want you to understand today, this is a small percentage of the body of Christ. But this is our job. Pastor Oliver, he preaches every Sunday night, 530, to the Latino in our community, to the Hispanic community. He and Luce do a great job. And he, listen to me, he's not there trying to impress these individuals. He's equipping them. He's giving them the tools. And if we fail giving you the tools, then we failed. Because the majority of ministry does not happen here. Let that sink in your mind. It happens when you walk out of these doors. Can I hear an amen? You guys can be seated. Thank you. So what I'm going to do for the next couple minutes, I have four points that I think will be helpful in marketplace ministry. Number one, we must be relatable to work the harvest effectively. Take a look at that. We must be relatable. Say relatable. Say relatable. Relatable. There we go. I'm about to speak Spanish here. You get that tongue rolling, Oliver, I'll be there. We must be relatable to work the harvest effectively. Paul understood this well. You see, one of our problems is we don't relate with this world. So many Christians, we just can't relate. We can't connect. They say, we don't understand where you're at, what you're talking about. You know, you, you, you guys aren't relatable. We must be relatable when we leave here. That we can connect with people. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 23. He said, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to who? To everyone. Why? To win as many as possible. He was saying, I w- I've got to be relatable. He goes on to say, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though, I'm, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. Why? So as to win those not having the law. Verse 22, he said, to the weak, I became weak. To win the weak. I had become all things to all people so that by all possible, possible means I might save some. And then he goes on. He said, I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Paul is explaining to us the importance of being relatable. This is what he said. He said, when, I, he said, when I'm around the Jews, I'm going to relate to the Jews. I'm not going to justify, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, go beyond the principles of God's word, but I will be like them if need be and when need be to win them to Christ. And, it, and he goes on, he says the weak, and, and I want to give you an example of this in our church. There's two ministries that's absolutely thriving in our church. Well, there's multiple ones, but I just want to touch on two. One of those ministries is our recovery ministry. Celebrate recovery. Praise the Lord for Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery is designed around a need in our community. And so on Tuesday night, if you come by the broadcast campus, you're going to see this parking lot full. Many times it'll be full. It'll look like a Sunday morning service. This past Tuesday when we came through, there were 260 people here celebrating their recovery. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, I'm sure that some people ask the question to to, to me or to this church, how can you, Pastor Pacer, um, minister to people who are in recovery? Yeah, you did some things that you shouldn't have done, but you were never addicted to a drug. How do you relate? How do you relate to these people? Why is it such a drawing force? Why are these people drawn to you or to this ministry or to this church? Can I tell you why? It's because they know that you really care. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I've not been there, but I care about that person that is there. And I'm willing, if need be, to get right down where they're at and lift them out of that ditch. Can I hear an amen? That, that's us. So, but you don't understand. It's okay. That, this right here supersedes me understanding is me caring. When you care about people around you, you don't have to have walked, you didn't have to walk in their shoes. 
They're drawn to that. It's, it's attractive. Another ministry. What about the prison ministry in this church? I mean, right now we have thousands of people that are watching, live streaming from their devices. Friday, Friday afternoon, I get a message on my phone. It was a live, it was a FaceTime. I pull up, I've got this FaceTime message from Amanda. She's walking out the doors of the Sevier County Correctional Facility. And she's saying, I'm out, I'm out, and here I come. Here I come. She's here today. Come on, can you celebrate Amanda? You need to praise the Lord because that's what God is doing. Come on, give him praise right now because God's moving. God's moving, amen? You may say, well, pastor, I don't get excited about that. Then there's probably not a lot that you would get excited about because if you had a son or daughter was it that was at the bottom of the barrel, at the point of no return, living in depression and darkness, had nowhere to, to go but to crime, to drugs, to alcohol. And then somebody sent a message through a device that you're paying for and said, we love you. You have a hope. You have a future. God's going to help you. Listen to me. And that kid got a hold of that message. I don't care what jail he's in, what prisons he's in got that message and said, they're talking to me. Listen to me. The, the gospel doesn't call anyone. The, gus, the gospel goes to everyone and it works with everyone. Can I hear an amen? Come on, give him praise right there if you believe that. So, so the prison ministry, thriving. And, and so I look at myself and, and, and guys, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Listen to me. You're there incarcerated. I've never spent one night in a jail. Never. Well, how can you effectively minister to the inmates? How can you do that? How, how can you do it? Oh, you listen to me closely. It's because we care. It's because we genuinely love people. I've heard, I've heard inmates that, that show up here and they would say that when I look in that camera and I tell people that there's hope and I tell people that we care and I invite people to our church when they get out, that it means something. Listen to me. When, you, when you're getting a peanut butter jelly sandwich every day or a peanut butter sandwich without the jelly and that's your thing and listen, and somebody gives you hope, one of the first things that Amanda said, I'm going to get me something good to eat. You don't even realize the magnitude of what God's doing around here. And so many times, though, guys, the enemy would say, well, you can't do it because you don't fit. Listen to me. If God's touched your life and saved your soul, you fit. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen. Last, when I, I was thinking about myself not being in jail, that's, you know, my, both, neither of my brothers can say the same. I had to throw that in. There's always this competition on who's the best and who's, who's, who's the worst. I just didn't get caught. They both did. Can I tell you a story? I, I shared this in the first service. It wasn't part of my notes, but I think you'd like to hear it. On oh, my brother Steve. Would you guys like to have a little ammo on Steve? Steve and Tina are down in Sarasota live streaming right now, and he didn't know he's going to get this message shared, but I've got to share it. So... Steve's like 16 years old, and we were hanging out at this place down in Browns Creek. You guys know where Browns Creek is down here on the right? Well, they had, a, they had like an arcade. They had a pool hall there, and, and that, was, that was my regular place on the weekend, and uh, it was called Gameland. Anybody ever remember Gameland? Is there anybody here? A couple of you remember Gameland. Well, so I'm in Gameland one day, one night, and I'm there, and Steve comes pulling in in a red Toyota Corolla just just beat up, just a junker, and he comes pulling in the parking lot. He jumps out, and he comes running in, in, in the pool hall where we're shooting pool. And, and you guys, if you know Steve, he's always been that cocky redhead, you know? He comes, he's always a little bigger than me, you know, but he comes, comes in kind of being cocky in his strut. He's got his strut going, and, uh, and he's walking around. We're saying, hey, and, and then out of the blue, he said, what are they doing? And it's like, what? And, and I looked outside, and there were blue lights, there were blue lights at his car. Steve, again, I promise you, here's the way it, he puffed that chest out. Here's a 16-year-old. He's going out to take care of business, find out what's going on. I, I kid you not. 
So I follow him out there. I still remember I had a cast on my arm at the time. I follow him out there, and he's, he's, he's probably out, you know, it's quite a, quite a bit further ahead than I am. He gets there, and he kind of like real smart asks the police, what are you doing? You know, that's just Steve. Like, what are you doing? And, and he immediately didn't start the conversation off right. <laughs> and they came back to him, and they said, uh, you left your door open on your car. So he got out, and he left his door open. And he said something else smart. And they said, well, we can give you a ticket because your tag's not uh, appropriately attached and I remember looking at his tag, and he's got baling string. He's got it tied on with baling string. It's drooping. You know, the, the string's on there. And, and they said, we can give you a ticket. And uh, he said something else. And, and then they said, well, we can take you to jail. I'll never forget this, guys. Steve looked at that policeman. He said, that's all right. Me and Don Hobbs are just like that. <laughs> I know most of you don't know Don Hobbs. He, he's no longer living. But he was the sheriff in Blunt County. Let me tell you how it proceeded from there. It wasn't good for Steve. They spun him around so quick. They had him handcuffed. He was in the back of the cruiser and he was driving down the road like, what did I do? Steve, here, here was the problem. Here's the problem, the whole problem there. Steve didn't realize that Don Hobbs was the sheriff of Blount County and Steve was in Maryville's jurisdiction. And the city of Maryville and the county at that time didn't get along very well. So that was just another reason to take that boy to Blunt County Jail. So mom and I went and bailed him out a little later on. But I just said all that to say that, uh, you know, I've, I've not spent the time in jail. I've not been there. But you don't have to necessarily walk in somebody else's shoes to be able to relate. Paul was relatable. And he said, he said through the scripture that, that it's important to relate. Be genuine. Just be real. Be who you are. Don't be a fake. Don't be a fraud. Just be true to yourself. Be who you are. People are drawn to that. Second thing I want to say today is marketplace ministry is underrated. Take a look at that. Marketplace ministry is underrated. We don't talk about it enough. 99% of the ministry here, 99% of you are, are ministering in the marketplace, but yet we don't talk about it. And that's why the Lord dealt with me about sharing this. Look at this scripture. Acts chapter 17, verse 17. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace, how often? Daily. daily. Say daily. Daily with those who happen to be there. So daily, they're working in the marketplace. This concept of marketplace ministry is nothing new. As a matter of fact, Jesus did the majority of his ministry in the marketplace or in the workplace. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 56. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or in the country, they laid the sick in the, in the marketplace, and they begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. Can I hear an Amen. So he wasn't necessarily going into the temples or the synagogues. He's going into the place where people dwell, where they live. He was ministering where the lost people gathered. Places like the well, where he met the woman. Places like the wedding. Places like the beach, out on the beach, on the, on the shore side. Uh, about the funeral or along the roadside. So where is one place that lost people gather? I want you to think about it for a second. Somebody said a bar. Yeah, evidently not just lost people gathered there. I preached on that last week, so we'll move on, though. Where else? A little broader. Work. Somebody said work. Marketplace. Lost people gather every single day in your workplace where you show, where you show up Monday morning. And I have a question. Do you have a strategic plan for marketplace ministry? Do you have a plan for marketplace ministry? Are you, are you using your time in the workplace to minister to others? Do you talk to people about Jesus in the marketplace, in the workplace, when you're outside the, the four walls of the church? Look at Luke chapter 14, verse 23. He said, Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and what? Compel them to come that my house may be filled. The best mission field that I know of is the marketplace. 
It's where you work. It's where you live. It's where you go. It's where you spend the majority of your time. It's the people you encounter on Monday morning. Are you making it a point to be Christ-like in the workplace? I think it's important that we think about the marketplace. Third point. Third point is simply this. Don't leave your faith at home. Look at that. Don't leave your faith at home. Guys, I shared earlier, the majority of my life I've spent in the marketplace. Either running a business that, that, I, that we owned or working for secular government. And I've worked at all levels. I've worked at the lowest level. I've worked in management. And, I, and, and so I understand what it's like and the importance of being Christ-like in the marketplace. But I'm going to say this today. Don't leave your faith at home. Let's all carry our faith. See, the cultural view is that Christianity does not belong in the marketplace. That's what the, the, the view in culture and society is. It belongs at the house or it belongs in the home. And society's cultivated this idea of separation of faith and everything else. Am I right? Separation of faith and everything else. Culture suggests that everything should come out of the closet except for your faith. I see some people nodding your head. We need to talk about everything now except your faith. You can tell everybody what you believe, what you think. You can post it. You can, you, you know, on the job, but don't talk about your faith. Don't share about your faith. And so this is what's happening in society. And you want to know what, what the problem is with our society? Is we're keeping our faith at home or in our churches. And if we're doing that, I would call that type of faith a hidden faith. Say hidden faith. I would say, I would call that a hidden faith. Christ never intended that this be the case. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are, it's hid to the lost. If I'm hiding, and, and here's, what I've, here's, here's what I've seen. Again, I've worked 20 years as a Christian in the marketplace. And what I see is I see Christians gather together. And the lost all over here. And we'll let our light shine around the Christians. But when it comes around the lost, we just either avoid, we don't relate, or we definitely don't let our light shine. We keep our mouth shut. And there's enough, come on, somebody needs to, you agree with that. I'm going to tell you, you do you know what Denzo needs? Denzo needs to see some real Christians. Not Christians that call themselves Christians and then have an affair with the lady next, in the next line and say it's okay. It's not okay. Did you hear me? That's not okay. It never was okay. And if you're doing that or you're contemplating doing it, you are in danger of the judgment of God. Don't play with it. Don't play with it. Stay as far away from it as you can get. Arconic, you know what they need to see? They need to see real Christians. I'm talking about... I'm talking about men that have backbone, not men that cheat on their wives. Where's your backbone at? Stand your ground. Live right. Live for God. I'm not saying you can be perfect, but I'm saying you don't have to live like this world. That's the reason the world's not drawn to your Christianity, because they don't see it in our lives. The marketplace needs to see Jesus. The jail needs to see Jesus. I'm telling you, and, and, and ladies, it's not just for the men. It's not just for the men. Just because things are not going well at home and that guy's been complimenting you time and time again, don't think for a, for a second he's not a wolf. Don't think for a second that he loves you. He's a liar. And the spirit that's driving him is not of God. I bind that and I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I bind that and I rebuke it in Jesus' name, Lord of God. You have no power. We take authority in the name of Jesus over our community, over the workplace, over the marketplace. And we call it to be a place that's holy. So what are you saying, Pastor, what should do? Everybody buy a megaphone and stand out there in front of the line and preach the gospel. No, no, that's ineffective. 
I'm not going to equip you with something that's ineffective. And I thank God that he allowed me to live there and be there long enough because I think I know what is effective. And here's what's effective. Before you say anything, let your actions match God's word. Start there. Start there. Start letting your lifestyle matter. It means something. Live right. And then when you say something, they're going to listen. What else can you tell me? How, how, I'm, 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 I'm chasing some rabbit trails, but let me chase them for a second. Listen to me. Your work matters. The type of work you do. Are you doing work that's commendable to God? The Bible says do all things as unto the Lord. Is people watching your work, your craft, what it is you're doing, and they're, and they're drawn to it because it's so good, because you're putting such effort into making it good? The Bible says that people will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Christians, believers should be the best employees. Bar none, the best employees. Man, I tell you what, it, it gets quiet when you start preaching the truth. I'm telling, listen, I'm trying to equip us that, see, listen, people aren't going to follow you to church if you are not living a Christian walk in front of them at work. You live right at work and they'll follow you to church. You know, last night, Connie and I, we were over at one of our church members. He's not been here actively in about a year. And you guys know Bud Jackson? The greeter back here at the door, he's, he's been the greeter for years. He, he wears a jacket every Sunday morning, and he's known for giving hugs. He hugs everyone. Such a good man, he and his wife, Joe. We were there visiting last night, and we were just talking about, you know, how Joe, Joe I mean, Bud was telling me, he said, you know, I get season tickets to the Maryville football games every year. And he was sharing with me, he said, here's what I do when I get there. I get there early. And I make it a point to go around everybody in my area and invite them to church. I thought, that's awesome. Then he shared a story. He said, I was, my wife and I, we were over to, at a Lady Vols game. And we were up in the nosebleed section. A lady comes over and she said, hey, would you guys like an upgrade? Well, sure. They took us down to the second row. Didn't cost us anything. Second row, put us by this guy. And he started talking to him about Jesus. And he shared with him. He said, um, he started talking about our church. And this guy lives in Jefferson City, and Bud's trying to get him to drive to church here. <laughs> and finally, and fi some of them will. How many of you today drove over an hour to be in this service? Hold your hand up. Hold it up high. Come on. Hold it up. Hold it up high. Come on. Stand up if you drove over an hour today. Come on. Look back here. Come on. Give a hand. Give a hand. That's commitment. Amen. Now, the guys over here, they had an incentive. Their son leads worship, okay? But they did drive from Kentucky, so that's awesome. But, but I, what are you saying? I'm saying that sharing the gospel with people is, is important. But as I was talking about this, uh, Bud, Bud realized he, that this guy wasn't going uh, to drive to church here. So here's what he asked him. He said, here's what I want to ask you. Go to a church close to you Sunday morning. He said, I would just wish you would do that. And finish the conversation. At the end of the ball game, Bud said he's getting ready to leave. And the guy looks over and he said, I'm, I'm going to make you a promise. My wife and I will go to a church Sunday morning. Do you see the, that is, that, but I wanted to say this. After he shared that, Joe asked me a question. And she said, do you remember Bud before he was filled with the Spirit? And I do. He was super, super introverted and quiet. And now he talks to everyone. And she shared. She said, what happened? He, he goes up to one of these men's encounters. You guys had it up at Eagle Rock. And he come back a different man. He come back this man. I'm telling everybody about Jesus. It's filled with the Spirit. We all need to be filled with the Spirit, glory to God. If it works for Bud, it'll work for me. Amen? How many of you need to be filled with the Spirit? We all do. So he said that, he said, if our gospel be hid, it's, it's hid to them who are lost. What are some ways that the, the gospel's hid? By simply not mentioning it. If we fail to mention the gospel, it's hidden. 
You guys realize that the gospel message that you have, it's the best documented event that's ever happened on planet Earth? Jesus, the Son of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, gave himself a ransom, died on a Roman cross, laid in a borrowed tomb, raised on the third day, seen by more than 500, descended to the throne of God, waiting on the signal to come back for his church. If you want that, email me, and I will send that to you. Amen? And you can say it a little bit slower than I did, but that's the gospel. That's it. That's the gospel. That's the power of the gospel, and it works. Can I hear an amen? Second way the gospel is hid, by not living it. I talked about that a second ago. Third way is by not inviting people to church. We talked about that. We can do these things. Look at Matthew 5.14. He said, you are, say I am. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 15, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. It gives light to who? All. It gives light to all who are in where? In the house. So when you're a light in the marketplace, it's giving a light to everyone that's, a, that's around you. Last point. This last point is for, for you business owners, some of you people who are contemplating, maybe you've been thinking about starting a business, or students. You're not sure what you're going to do with your life. You're not sure your career path. The fourth and last point is this. Your business is a vital ministry. Your business is a vital ministry. It ministers to your family. It ministers to your employees. It ministers to your church. And it ministers to your community. Have you ever thought about this? All the financial resources that come into this church flow through the marketplace. Nothing was just generated here today. There was no resources. You guys didn't come in here and find a bunch of money and bring it to the house of the Lord. I don't think. Where did it come from? It came from the marketplace. It came from you going out and working with your hands. You guys that, and, and ladies that have businesses, creating businesses for the marketplace. And so... If you guys are, if some of you are considering starting a business, as you've seen here today, there's a great need for resources in the church. Can I hear an amen? amen. You know, you, you may be here today or watching online. Maybe you're incarcerated and you're saying, well, I, I can't get involved in the marketplace ministry. Yes, you can. Don't doubt for a second. There's a guy in this church who doesn't have a high school diploma. Most people would maybe consider him uneducated and not having the ability to, to do anything great in the terms of the marketplace. The same man that I'm talking about, God spoke to him, told him to start a business, and he started it. And it started becoming effective, and it started growing. And he started using God's word as principles to operate by he took care of his employees when he only had one, and then two, and it grew. This same man called me up one day. He's a member of this church. He serves as a deacon. He serves you. He called me up, and he said, Pacer, I hear we're, we're going to be broadcasting the sermons into the Blount County Jail. How much does it cost? I want to pay for that every single month. That was the first seed, the first fruits of the jail ministry. And then he called me again, and he said, I want to pay for two jails. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned that how many of you could, could imagine being in 40 correctional facilities soon? We're spending $10,000 a month right now to make sure that this gospel is pumped into every correctional facility that we can afford to, to get it into. But I don't believe that's enough. I believe there needs to be more. And for that to happen, what needs to happen, guys? I think we need to have more young people get involved in marketplace ministry. I believe we need more businesses to start. I mean, we need more people that are working in the workplace to understand that this is truly a ministry. You guys that are managing people, the, you have a great responsibility. And don't for one second ever feel like 
that you're not enough because you're not standing on a stage or in full-time ministry. I could care nothing. I could care less about that. I've worked in both of them. I'm going to tell you something. The power of marketplace ministry is greater than you'll ever realize. And God will use you in great ways if you'll commit your business and commit your life and commit your work and commit your resources. Don't try to live life to gather resources and consume them yourself. Because at the end of the day, guys, I want you to listen to me closely. It leaves you empty. The only thing that brings eternal value is when you seek God and allow him to use you, use your work, use your ministry to help other people and to build the kingdom of God up. That's what he's looking for. And that brings value. I'll die for that, glory to God. I'll live my life as a sacrifice for that because it's greater than me. It's greater than you. Realizing that I can make an impact. I can help the Amandas who get out of jail Friday to have a place to come, to have incredible worship when they get here, to have the, the, the things that the church offers, but more than any of that, to resource her, to go back into her place and be a light. Listen, guys, what you're doing matters. Don't forever one second, second guess your ministry. Don't feel less than because you're not in full-time ministry. Paul wasn't full-time ministry. Where do we get all this stuff? This, it drives me crazy because that's not where it's at. You want me to tell you where it's at? It's out there Monday morning. It's out there where you're showing up at work, being a light, sharing the light, ministering. Glory to God. Don't underestimate the power of marketplace ministry. The elders of this church, three of them are, are, are businessmen. That's what, that's what they do is marketplace ministry. None of them are paid to be elders. The elders here in our church, you, they're not paid. This is what they give back. It's called marketplace ministry. But I believe today that there's, there's going to be some new people that step up and receive your call and understand. I'm going to tell you something. I've lived with lack. Say lack. That means not having much. And I've lived with more. Say more. There's no lack in the kingdom. There's no lack in the kingdom. There is no lack in the kingdom of God. When we understand that we live one life and we have the ability to provide for the kingdom of God, to excel and impact our community. Listen to me. What could one church do in Blunt County? I just wonder. Could one church stream messages into their local jail? Could one church stream messages into jails as far away as Mississippi? Could one church stream into other countries? What can happen? Anything. Anything can happen if we believe and we trust God. Trust God. I want you to look at this verse. Deuteronomy 8.18. And you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is He who gives power, who gives you power to get what? Who gives you power to get wealth? Say God. God gives you power to get wealth. Is there a reason for it? Let's read on. That He may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Do you understand why God is, is, is in the marketplace ministry? And he's in giving you wealth? It's really for one purpose, to establish his covenant. To establish his kingdom in this earth. It's about him, amen? It's about serving him. And, and then I'm, I'm going to leave you with this. Please, business owners, future business owners, Remember these last four points. Number one, create a biblical mission statement for your company. If you don't have a, a mission statement for your company, create one. You guys that are in management, create a mission statement. I'm not saying post it at your workplace, but have it for you to look at. What is my mission statement? Number two, use your business to fund the kingdom. Number three, run your business with an eternal perspective. 
Number four, don't hide your faith. And this right here is very important. Don't hide your faith, but never use it to sell your product. That's what the Lord said. Don't ever use your faith to sell a product. You should have the best product, but don't use your faith to sell it. If there's one time that God got very angry in the word, it was when they were using God's product to sell their product. And it was in the temple. They were using the church as an opportunity to get ahead, and God didn't like it. Don't, 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 don't that, that, that'll get you in trouble. Amen. You guys listen to me today? Is this making sense? Last verse, Colossians 3.23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Everything you do, do it unto the Lord and not unto men. And God will bless it. Amen. Can we stand? You have a purpose. I got to say that again. You have a purpose. Somebody didn't hear me. I'm not just throwing a word out there or, or a phrase. You have a purpose. You have a purpose in the kingdom of God. You matter. You count. It's important. Everybody has a role to play. We all have a role to play. Last Sunday, I witnessed different people using their gifts to fulfill a mission. Let me tell you what happened. Last Sunday morning, after the second service, we, the altars were full, people were praying, and, people, and most people had left. And I noticed something happening over here to my right. Right in this area right here, I noticed something happening. I noticed people gathering right over here. So I walked over to this area, and here's what I, I witnessed. I noticed an elderly man having an, an he, he was having an emergency, a medical emergency. It was happening right here at the end of the service. But I noticed three people gathered around him. It, there were more than that, but there were three that I really picked up on. Number one, I noticed one of our congregational pastors. The second person I noticed was a professional security member who works in the marketplace. The third person that I witnessed was a professional medical agent who works in the hospital. These three were working with this guy. Let me tell you what I witnessed as I watched him. The congregational pastor was, in, was right behind this man and he had his hands on both shoulders and he was praying diligently. The guy in front, the professional security team member, he was calling making sure that we had emergency transportation lined up for this gentleman. And the guy in the medical field, he's got his equipment, he's checking vital signs, blood pressure, all of those things, checking all. And here's what I watched. The Lord just showed me, he said, this is a, a picture of the body of Christ. The, the body of Christ has different members, but one mission. The mission was to help this gentleman was to help him get back to health. And everyone was, see, if everyone would have been congregational pastors, do you, you guys with me today? If all of us were congregational pastors, who's going to check the vital signs? If everyone is in the medical field, who's going to pray the prayer of faith? If everyone's calling the ambulance, who's going to take care of him while they come? Does that make sense? We are the body of Christ. We all, we all have purpose. You have a purpose in the body of Christ. Here's what my prayer is today. That you will leave this building realizing that your greatest opportunity for ministry will happen when you walk out of this exit door. When I say amen, your ministry begins. Does that make sense? When I say amen, your ministry begins. And let's do it effective. Let's do it with everything that's within us. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this moment. The power of the Holy Spirit moving right now. God, the call to do all things is unto the Lord, to be a light to our community, to our town, to our neighborhood. And I thank you for a church that does that. They don't treat waitresses bad. 
waiter's bad. They treat them the way that they would want to be treated. They don't treat people bad, Lord, that may be down in life, but they're there to help them up. I thank you for that, God. Lord, there's people here today that are lost. And I pray you save them before they leave. If you're here right now and you just say, Pastor, God's been speaking to me. I need to surrender my life to Jesus. But I'm not sure I have the courage or the ability to to live this life. If that's you, and you just say, Pastor, will you remember me in prayer? That God would give me the, the ability to surrender. Hold up your hand right now. Everybody praying. Hands going up. Hold up your hand. Amen. God sees hands. Let them let them raise. I believe God's going to save 20 or 30. Come on, hold it up high. Come on, give it to Jesus. Amen. God sees your hand. He sees you. He knows right where you're at. Come on, hold your hand up in the stadium seats online right now. If God's speaking to you, this is the best decision you'll ever make in your life. There's not even a close second. It's surrendering your life to Jesus. Father, I pray right now, God, that you would give give each one of these individuals, God, the strength and the ability to say yes to you today. That they would not leave this property the same way they came, but they would leave as daughters and sons of the Lord Jesus Christ. They would leave saved, born again, with a new heart and a new start and a new life. In the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for each hand that was raised. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come. I'm going to ask the campus pastors if you guys would come forward. We're going to sing one last song. And as we sing this song, I believe that God's going to be ministering to some people in a supernatural way. Some of you that have been praying about a career change, maybe maybe you need to, to agree with someone in prayer. And this is your time. I'm going to ask you, to come forward, pray with one of these individuals that are here today to agree in prayer that God's going to give you what you need. Some of you students, you're still praying about what's next and you're not sure and you've had a lot of different thoughts. And that's, should I do this? Should I do that? Today, I'm going to invite you to come forward because I believe that the Lord's going to give you some direction. Some of you, maybe you're in the middle of deciding your major. You're not sure. I'm going to ask you to come. Because I believe that the Lord is going to give you some direction on what major you need to select. How many of you believe that God's going to minister here in the next few minutes in this altar? I believe it with all my heart. Let's 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 worship. Let's get in the mindset of prayer. And let's ask him to move in the name of Jesus in this altar today. Thank you.
every detail of.